Hello and welcome back to what will be the final uh, segment for me from the reading, the dramatic reading of The Indian in the Cupboard by Lynn Reed Banks. Again, this is a childhood favorite book that was read to me when I was, I think, in second grade. And I've been doing these recordings and putting them up on YouTube primarily for my kids. But if your kids uh, enjoy it or the, the young at heart, I hope you enjoy this. And uh, I want to take you into chapter 14, The Missing Key. Uh, and where we had just left off is... Patrick and Omri have narrowly escaped uh, having their their secret about these moving figures, these these real life micro people that they've now created through this cupboard was almost discovered by the the owner of the convenience store where Omri had gotten the plastic figures originally. They narrowly escaped that. They've healed up their friendship and Omri just invited Patrick to come on over and spend the night. Uh, And Patrick was, was very excited. So let's see what happens now. Chapter 14 titled The Missing Key. Omri's brothers were already sitting at the tea table when the two boys rushed in. Hi, what's for tea? Omri asked automatically. Gillian and Adil were didn't answer. Adil had a funny smirk on his face. Omri hardly noticed. Let's make a sandwich and eat it upstairs, he suggested to Patrick. They slapped some peanut butter on bread, poured mugs of milk, and hurried up the stairs to Omri's room, whispering all the way. How long does it take? Only a few minutes. Can I see her? Wait till we get upstairs. Omri opened the door and stopped dead. The white medicine cupboard was gone. Where is it? Gasped Patrick. Omri didn't say a word. He turned and rushed downstairs again with Patrick behind him. Okay, where have you hidden it? He shouted as soon as he burst into the kitchen. I don't know what you're referring to, Adil said loftily. Yes, you do. You've taken my cupboard. And supposing I did? It was only to teach you a lesson. You're always taking away my things and hiding them. Now you'll see how funny it is, isn't it? Now you'll see how funny it isn't. When did I last take anything of yours? Tell me one thing. In the last month. My football shorts, Adil said promptly. I never touched your stupid shorts. I already swore I hadn't. I had to miss the game again today because I didn't have them, and I got a detention for it. So you can be grateful I'm only punishing you tit for tat and not bashing you in, said Adil with maddening calm. Omri felt so furious, he even wondered for a moment whether it was worth bashing Adil in. But Adil was enormous, older brother, and it was hopeless. So after gazing at him for another moment with hate-filled eyes, Omri turned and dashed upstairs again, almost falling over Patrick on the way. What do you do? Look for it, of course. He was turning Adil's room upside down like a madman when Adil, slowly mounting the stairs in the direction of his homework, heard the racket and came running. He stood in the doorway, looking at the shambles of the pulled-out drawers and de-gutted cupboards and furniture pulled awry. You little swine, he howled and dived at Omri. Omri fell to the ground with Adil on top. I'll tear everything you've got to pieces till you give it back to me. Omri shouted in jerks as Adil shook and pummeled him. Then cough up my shorts. I haven't got your stinking shorts, screamed Omri. Are these them? Asked a small voice in the background. Adil and Omri stopped fighting. And Adil, sitting astride, twisting his neck to see. Patrick was just lifting a crumpled navy blue object from behind a radiator. Omri felt the anger go out of Adil. Oh, yes, it is, as a matter of fact. How did they get there? But Omri knew perfectly well how. Adil had hung them there to dry, and they've dropped off backward. Adil scrambled up, looking distinctly sheepish. He even helped Omri to his feet. Well, but you've hidden things in the past, he mumbled. How was I to know? Can I have my cupboard now? Yeah, it's up in the attic. I piled a whole lot of stuff on it. Omri and Patrick took the stairs to the attic two at a time. They found the cupboard quite quickly, under a heap of bits and pieces. But Omri had carried it down to his room again uh, before he made the fatal discovery. The key! The little twisted key with its red satin ribbon was missing. Once again, sorry about that. Jeez, everybody wants to uh, have a little text message here. Um, Once again, Omri and... Uh, and uh, Patrick ran into a deal's room to find a deal uncomplainingly putting things straight. What happened to the key? What key? There was a key in the cupboard door with the red ribbon. I didn't notice. Let's put this on. Do not disturb. 
Um, they went out and closed the door. Omri was now feeling desperate. We've got to find it. It doesn't work without the key. They searched the attic till supper time. Never had Omri so clearly seen the point of all his mother's urgings to keep everything in its proper place. The attic was just short of a glory hole where they could play and leave a total mess. Um, and that was what they always did, only clearing spaces when they needed them for a new layout or for some special game. Our, our, my attic at home is kind of like that too, where I grew up. Just everybody piles stuff up there, rearranges it as needed. Uh, their way of clearing was just to shove things aside into ever more chaotic heaps. Underneath the heaps were all the myriad little oddments that were small enough to filter through the bigger things. Marbles, uh, wheels of matchbox cars, bits of Lego, small tools, parachute men, cards, and so on and so on. Plus all sorts of fragments that could have been almost anything. At first they just raked through everything, but after a while Omri realized they would just have to clear up systematically. Otherwise, it was like the old saying about looking for a needle in a haystack. He found some boxes, and they began sorting things into them. Legos here, parts of games there, water pistols, tricks and novelties in another. Bigger thing. I love to organize, so this is, that's like the best part of the book for me. Uh, bigger things they stacked neatly onto what his father rather bitterly called the shelves provided, which normally stood empty since everything was on the floor. <laughs> In an amazingly short time, the floor was clear except for a few odd things that they hadn't found homes for and a great deal of mud, dust, and sand. Where did all this come from? asked Patrick. Oh, Gillian brought up boxes of it from the garden to make a desert scene, said Omri. Months ago. We might as well sweep it up. He looked around. Despite his anxiety about the key, he felt a certain pride. The room looked entirely different. There was a real playing space now. He went downstairs and fetched a broom, a dustpan, and a soft brush. We'll have to do this carefully, he said. It'd be terrible if we threw it away with the sand. We could sieve it, suggested Patrick. That's a good idea, in the garden. They carried the sand out in a cardboard box, and Omri followed his father's, uh, borrowed his father's large garden sieve. Omri held it, and Patrick spooned in the sand and earth with a trowel. Several small treasures came to light, such as a ten-cent piece but no key. Omri was in despair. He and Patrick sat down on the lawn under a tree, and Omri took the two little men out of his pocket. Where woman? Little Bear asked instantly. Never mind the women. Where's the vittles? asked the ever-hungry Boone grumpily. Omri and Patrick fed them some more chocolate, and with a deep sense of misery, Omri produced the plastic Indian woman from his pocket. Little Bear stopped chewing his chocolate the moment he saw her and gazed in rapture. It's funny to imagine this little man. You, you get it. It was obvious he was half in love with her already. He reached out a hand and tenderly touched her plastic hair. Make real. Now, he breathed. I can't, said Omri. Why can't, said Little Bear sharply. The magic's gone. Now Boone stopped eating too. He and Little Bear exchanged a frightened look. You mean you can't send us back? Asked Boone in an awe-stricken whisper. Never? we got to live in a giant's world forever. It was clear that Little Bear had been explaining matters. Don't you like being with us? asked Patrick. Well, uh, won't want to hurt your feelings none, said Boone, but just think about how you'd feel if I was as big as you are and you were me. Little Bear, asked Omri. Little Bear dragged his eyes away from the plastic figure and fixed them like bright crumbs of black glass on Omri. Omri good, he pronounced at last. But little bear Indian brave, Indian chief. How be brave, how be chief, with no other Indians? Omri opened his mouth. If he had not lost the key, he might have rashly offered to bring to life an entire tribe of Indians simply to keep little bear contented. Through his mind flashed the knowledge of what this meant. It wasn't the fun, the novelty, the magic that mattered anymore. What mattered was that Little Bear should be happy. See, that's what I like about this book, is it kind of reminds us, even through this metaphor of these little figures, that people are people. They have feelings. They deserve to be happy. And sometimes putting them in this kind of like little magical situation can help remind us of that. Uh, everybody matters. Everybody's perspective matters. You know, it's, it's good. 
It wasn't the fun, the, the magic anymore. What matters is that he should be happy. And for that, he would take on almost anything because he loves little little bear, right? They all sat quietly on the lawn. There seemed nothing more to say. A movement near the back of the house caught Omri's eye. It was his mother coming out to hang some wet clothes. He thought she moved as if she were tired and fed up. She stood for a moment on the back balcony looking at the sky. Then she sighed and began pegging the clothes to the line. On impulse, Omri got up and went over to her. You... you haven't found anything of mine, have you? he asked. No, I, I don't think so. What have you lost? But Omri was too ashamed to admit he'd lost the key she told him to be so careful of. Oh, nothing much. He went back to Patrick, who was showing the men an ant. Boone was trying to pat his head, but it wasn't very responsive. Well, Omri said, we might as well make the best of things. Why not bring the horses out and give the fellows a ride? This cheered everyone up, and Omri ran out and brought the two horses down carefully in an empty box. Next, Patrick stamped out two square feet of lawn, hard to give the horses a really good gallop. Quite a large black beetle alighted on the flattened part, and Little Bear shot it dead with an arrow. Holy smokes. This cheered him up a bit more, though not much. While the horses grazed the fresh grass, he kept giving great lovesick sighs, and Omri knew he was thinking of the woman. Maybe you'd rather not stay the night now, Omri said to Patrick. I want to, said Patrick, if you don't mind. Omri felt too upset to care one way or the other. When they were called in to supper, he noticed that Adil was trying to be friendly. But Omri wouldn't speak to him. Afterward, Adil took him aside. What's up with you now? I'm trying to be nice. You got your silly cupboard back. It's no good without the key. Well, I'm sorry. I must have dropped it on the way up to the attic. On the way up to the attic. Omri hadn't thought of that. Will you help me find it? He asked eagerly. Please. It's terribly important. Oh, all right then. The four of them hunted for half an hour. They didn't find it. After that, Gillian and Deal had to go out to some function at school, so Patrick and Omri had the television to themselves. They took out the two men and explained this new magic, and then they all watched together. This is a picture of them watching TV. You got Little Bear doing his bow and arrow thing. Pretty cool. First came a film about animals, which absolutely transfixed both the little men. Then a western came on. Omri thought they ought to switch it off, but Boone, in particular, set up uh, such a hull set up such a hullabaloo that eventually Omri said, "Oh, all right, just for ten minutes." Then, Little Bear was seated cross-legged on Omri's knee, while Boone, who had somehow gravitated back to Patrick, preferred to stand in his breast pocket, leaving his elbows along the pocket top with his hat on the back of his head, chewing a lump of tobacco he had on him. Patrick, who'd heard something of the boy cowboy's habits, said, Don't you dare spit. There's no spittoons here, you know. Let me listen to them talking, will you? said Boone. I just can't get over how they talk. Before the ten minutes was up, the Indians in the film started getting the worst of it. It was the usual sequence in which the pioneer wagons are drawn into the circle and the Indians are galloping around them while the outnumbered men of the wagon train fire muzzle-loading guns at them through the wagon wheels. Omri could sense Little Bear was getting restive and tense. Yeah, they've never even seen any technology like this, so it must feel like really real. As brave after brave bit the dust, he suddenly leapt to his feet. No good pictures, he shouted. What you talking about, Injun? Boone yelled tauntingly across the chasm dividing him from little bear that's how it was my pa my ma and pa was in a fight like that and my ma told me he and my, my oh, oh, yeah then my pa and my pa told me he done shot near a 15 or 20 of them dirty savages white men move on to land use water kill animals so what let the best man win and we won yippee he added as another television Indian went down with his horse on top of him. Omri was looking at the screen when it happened. In a lull on the soundtrack, he heard a thin, faint whistling sound and heard Boone grunt. He looked back at Boone swiftly and his blood froze. The cowboy had an arrow sticking out of its chest. For a couple of seconds, he remained upright in Patrick's breast pocket. Then quite slowly, he fell forward. 
Omri had often marveled at the way people in films, particularly girls and women, were given to letting out loud screams at dramatic or awful moments. Now he felt one rise in his own throat, and he would have let it out if Little Bear had not cried out first. Patrick, who had not noticed anything amiss until now, looked at Little Bear, saw where his bow arm had been pointing, and looked down at his own pocket. Over the top of it, Boone hung, head down, as limp as a piece of knotted string. Boone! Boone! No, snapped Omri. Don't touch him! Ignoring Little Bear, he tumbled down his trouser leg to the floor as he moved. Oh, ignoring Little Bear, who tumbled down his trouser leg as he moved, Omri very carefully lifted Boone clear between finger and forethumb and laid him on the palm of his hand. The cowboy lay face up with the arrow still sticking out of his chest. Is he dead? whispered Patrick in horror. I don't know. Shouldn't we take the arrow out? We can't. Little Bear must. With infinite care and slowness, Omri laid his hand on the carpet. Boone lay perfectly still. With such a tiny body, it was impossible to be sure whether the arrow was stuck in where his heart was or a little higher up towards his shoulder. The arrow shaft was so fine you could only make it out by the minute cluster of feathers. Little Bear, come here. Omri's voice was steely, a voice Mr. Johnson himself might have envied. It commanded obedience. Little Bear, scrambling to his feet after his fall, walked unsteadily to Omri's hand. Get up there and see if you've killed him. Without a word, Little Bear climbed onto the edge of Omri's hand and knelt down beside the prostrate Boone. He laid his ear against his chest just below the arrow. He listened, then straightened up, but without looking at either of the boys. Not killed, he said sullenly. Omri felt his breath go out in relief. Take the arrow out, carefully. If he dies now, it'll be double your fault. Little Bear put one hand on Boone's chest with his fingers on either side of the arrow, and with the other he took hold of the shaft where it went into Boone's body. Blood come. Need stop up whole. Omri's mother kept boxes of tissues in every room. Smart mom. Mainly so nobody would have an excuse to sit sniffling. My wife does the same. Patrick jumped up and brought this, tearing off a tiny corner and rolling it into a wad no bigger than a pinhead. Now it's got charms from your hand, said Omri. Where's the disinfectant? It's in the bathroom cupboard. Don't let my mom see you. While Patrick was gone, Omri sat motionless and silent his eyes fixed on Little Bear, still poised to pull out the arrow. After a very long minute, the Indian muttered something. Omri bent, his head lo Omri bent his head low. What? Little Bear, sorry. Omri straightened up, his heart cold and untouched. You'll be a lot sorrier if you don't save him, was all he said. Patrick raced back with a little bottle of Listerine. He poured a drop into the lid and dipped the little ball of tissue into it. Then he held the cap close to Little Bear. Go on, Omri ordered. Pull it out. Little Bear seemed to brace himself. Then he began to tremble. Then he began to tremble. Little Bear not do. Little Bear not doctor. Get doctor back. He no make wound good. We can't, said Omri shortly. The magic's gone. You must do it. Remember, one of the characters that Omri had let out was a World War I medic. Um, and then they put him back in. The magic's gone. Do it. You must do it. Do it now. Now, little bear. Again, the Indian stiffened. Closing his hand tightly around the arrow, slowly and steadily, he drew it out and threw it aside. Then as the blood welled over Boone's checked shirt, little bear swiftly squeezed the liquid out of the ball of tissue and pressed it against the wound. Use your knife now. Cut the dirty shirt away. Without hesitating, little bear obeyed. Boone lay still, his face under its tan... Um, his face, under its tan, had turned ashy gray. We need a bandage, said Patrick. There's nothing we can use, and we can't move him to wrap it around him. We'll have to use a tiny bit of band-aid. Again, Patrick went to the bathroom. Again, Omri, Little Bear, and Boone were left alone. Little Bear knelt now with his hands loose on his thighs, his head down. His shoulders rose and fell once. Was he sobbing? With shame or fear? Or could it be... Sorrow? Patrick returned with a box of band-aids and a pair of nail scissors. He cut out a square big enough to cover, I think nail scissors like nail clippers we call here in the United States. Remember this is in Britain? 
they got their own terminology. He cut out a square big enough to cover the whole of Boone's chest, and Little Bear stuck it on with great care, and even, Omri thought, tenderness. Now, said Omri, take off your chief's cloak and cover him up warmly. This, too, Little Bear did uncomplainingly. We'll take him upstairs and put him in bed, said Omri. Oh, God, I wish we had the key and I could get that doctor back. As they walked slowly upstairs, he told Patrick about the first World War soldier he had brought to life to tend Little Bear's wound, Little Bear's leg wound. We've got to find that key, said Patrick. We've just got to. Little Bear, still at Boone's side on Omri's hand, said nothing. In Omri's room, Patrick made a bed for the cowboy from a folded handkerchief and another woolen square from Omri's sweater. Omri slipped a bit of thin stuff, thin, stiff card between Boone and his own hand, and on this he transferred the wounded man without too much disturbance, which might have started the bleeding again. He was still unconscious. Little Bear silently stood by. Suddenly he moved. Reaching up, he snatched off his chief's headdress and threw it violently to the, onto the ground. Before Omri could stop him, he began jumping on it, and in a second or two all the beautiful, tall turkey feathers were bent and broken. Leaving it lying there, Little Bear took off across the carpet, running as hard as he could over the deep woolen tufts, stumbling sometimes, but running always in the direction of the seed box and his home. Patrick moved, but Omri said quietly, let him alone. It's intense, right? This is These are just plastic figures that have been brought to life trying to deal with this, this world, right? Um, so we've got another chapter here. I believe this is the last one. We'll keep going if you're still with me. This is called Under Floor adventure. Omri and Patrick decided they must take it in turns to sit up all night with Boone. It was getting to be tricky because of light showing under the door, but Omri unearthed the lopsided remains of a candle he had made himself from a candle-making kit. We can put it behind the dressing up crate, then the light won't show. They got into their pajamas. Patrick was supposed to be sleeping on a folding bed, so they got that ready to avoid rousing suspicion. When Omri's mother came in to kiss them goodnight, they were both in bed, apparently reading. The fact that Omri was reading in semi-darkness was nothing unusual. She was always at him about it. Oh, Omri, why won't you switch your bedside light on? You'll ruin your eyes. It doesn't work, said Omri promptly. Yes, it does. Daddy fixed it this morning. You know, you know what was wrong with it? What? asked Omri impatiently, wishing for once that she would go. That wretched rat of Gillian's had made a nest under the floorboards and lined it with bits of insulation it gnawed off the wires. It's a wonder he didn't electrocute itself. Omri sat up sharply. Do you mean it got loose? Mother gave a lopsided smile. Where have you been keeping yourself? It's been loose since last night. Have you noticed Gillian frantically looking for it? It seems to have taken up residence under your bed. Under my bed? Omri yelled, leaping out of it and dropping to his knees. It's no use looking for it. I mean right under, under the floor. Daddy caught a glimpse of it today when he had the boards up, but he couldn't catch it, of course. It's a matter of waiting till it comes out for food, and then... But Omri wasn't listening. A rat! That was all they needed. Mom, we've got to get it. We've got to. Why? You're not scared of it, are you? Me? Scared? Of that stupid rat? Of course not. But we've got to catch it, said Omri desperately. He felt wild and furious. How could Gillian have let the thing go? The perils that a rat presented to his little men simply turned his blood cold. And why, of all rooms in the house, should it have chosen his? He was tearing frantically at the edge of the carpet, trying to pull it back when his mother hiked him to his feet. Omri, that carpet and those floorboards have been taken up once today, and they've been put back once, and everything tidied up. Rat or no rat, I'm not going through it all again. Not tonight. Now get into bed and go to sleep. But in... To bed, I said, now. When she used that tone, there was no arguing with her. I know that tone my wife uses it. You better, you know, our kids know. Omri got into bed and was kissed and watched the light go off and the door close. As soon as her footsteps had faded, he leaped up again and so did Patrick. Now we must definitely stay awake all night. We mustn't close our eyes for a moment, said Omri. He was hunting through his ancient collection of book matches for one out of which his father had not cut the matches. At last he found... I don't know what book matches are, but... Oh, a matchbook, right. He had not cut out the matches. Because sometimes they have cool designs on them or memorabilia or whatever. At last he found one with matches in it and lit the candle. 
They were they very gently moved Boone's bed out of hiding and onto the bedside table, set the candle beside it, and sat one on each side watching Boone's dreadfully ill-looking face. The pink square band-aid moved fractionally up and down as he breathed. You could hardly see it. It was like watching the long hand of a clock moving. Only the strongest concentration enabled them to detect the faint motion. Hadn't we better move the seed box up here too? whispered Patrick. In the moment when Little Bear had shot Boone, Omri had been, om- had been almost angry enough to have fed him to the rat. But now his fury had cooled. He certainly didn't want anything awful to happen to him. Yes, let's. Between them, they cleared a place on the table and lifted the seed box with its longhouse, fireplace, and hitching posts up out of the reach of the prowling rodent. Careful, don't frighten the horses. The horses, however, were getting used to being carried out and hardly even looked up from munching their little piles of cutting grass. What adaptable creatures, right? I mean, I know this isn't real, but you can imagine that, right? There was no sign of life from the longhouse. There followed a timeless period of just sitting there, silently, their eyes fixed on Boone's still figure in the flickering candlelight. Omer began to feel lightheaded after a bit. The candle flame went fuzzy, and Boone's body seemed to vibrate as he stared at it. At the very back of his mind, something else was nagging. Nagging. He didn't ask himself what it was because he had a superstitious feeling that if he let his mind wander from Boone, even for a minute, Boone would slip away into death. It was as if only Omri's will and Patrick's were keeping that tiny, fragile heart beating. Suddenly, though, a thought, like a landscape lit up by lightning, flashed into the forefront of Omri's brain. He sat up, his eyes wide open, and his breath held. (gasps) Patrick! Patrick jumped. He'd been half asleep. What? The key. I know where it is. Where? Where? Right under my feet. It must have dropped through the floorboards when Dad opened them. There's nowhere else it could be. Patrick gazed at him in admiration, but also in dismay. How are we going to get it, he whispered. We'll have to take up the carpet first. Maybe Dad didn't nail all the boards down. Moving very quietly, they managed to lift one corner of Omri's bed and kick back the edge of the carpet from underneath. Another bit was under the bedside table leg, and that was tricky, but they shifted it between them in the end. Carefully, they folded the corner of carpet back on itself, exposing the boards. Omri then stuck his fingers down the narrow crack at the ends of the boards, one after another, testing to see if they could be lifted. Only one of them could. The rest were nailed down to the joists underneath. Making as little noise as possible, he hadn't heard his parents go to bed yet, Omri pried up the short end of the board. A hole, about six inches by eighteen, gaped in the light of the candle Patrick was holding. Even when he put the candle down the hole, they couldn't see much. We'll have to risk the bedside light, Omri said. They switched it on and carried it on its cord down to the hole. Kneeling on the floor, they peered down into the depths. They could make out the dusty lathe and plaster about a foot down and the top side of the ceiling of the room below, the room where Omri's parents were now sitting. We'll have to be dead quiet or they'll hear us. Dead quiet doing what? asked Patrick. It's not there. You'd see it if it was. It must be under one of the nailed down boards, said Omri despairingly. At the moment, they heard Little Bear calling them, and they stood up. He was standing outside the longhouse, naked but for his breechcloth. His hair hung loose. His face and chest and arms were smeared with ashes. His feet were bare. And having read some stories or seen some movies and stuff, I feel like that's a mourning sort of ritual, you know? Little Bear's obviously feeling really bad about what he did. Little Bear, what are you doing? asked Omri, aghast at his appearance. One fire. Want to make dance, call spirits, make Boone live. Omri looked at him for a moment and felt an ache in his throat that reminded him painfully of his babyish days, when he used to cry all the time, days he thought he had been left behind forever. Folks ever have that? A memory that suddenly brings back a feeling that you, you felt when you were really young? Little bear, dancing won't do any good. The spirits won't help. We need a doctor to get the doctor We need the key. Would you help us find it? Little Bear didn't move a muscle. I help. Gently, Omri picked him up. He knelt on the floor and put his hand down the hole. Patrick held up the light. 
Omri opened his hand and Little Bear stood on it, looking around into the dusty, dark tunnel stretching away under the floor, with a rat under there, too. I think it's somewhere down there, Omri said quietly, on the other side of that wooden wall. You'll have to find a way through, a, a hole or a crack or something. We'll give you all the light we can, but it's bound to be awfully dark on the other side. Do you think you can do it? I go, said Little Bear immediately. Right. Start looking for a way through. Little Bear, a tiny, vulnerable figure, strode off through the dust into the darkness under the floor. Omri pulled the lampshade off the bedside lamp and thrust the bulb down into the hole. He couldn't get his head in to watch, and Little Bear went out of sight almost at once. Is there a way through? he whispered down the tunnel. Yes, came Little Bear's voice. Big hole. I go through. Omri, give light. Omri pushed the light down as far as he could, but the base of the lamp made it stick. Can you see anything? he whispered as loudly as he dared. There was no answer. He and Patrick knelt there for an age. There wasn't a sound. Then Patrick said suddenly, Did he take his bow and arrows? No. Why? What if... Omri... What if he meets the rat? Omri had totally forgotten about the rat in the excitement of realizing what had happened to the key. Now he felt a strange jerk in his chest, as if his heart had hiccuped. He bent his head till his face was in the hole. He could smell the dust. The bright bulb was between him and the place where Little Bear was presumably gone through a hole in the joist to the next section of the underfloor space. A hole! What could make a hole right through a joist? What else but a rat gnawing away all day? A rat at this moment it was out on its night prowl, a hungry rat who hadn't eaten for 24 hours. A pink-eyed, needle-toothed, omnivorous, giant rat. Little Bear! Omri called frantically into the blankness. Come back! Come back! Utter silence. And then he heard something. But it wasn't Little Bear's voice. It was the scuttering sound of a rodent's hard little hairless feet on lathe, on lathe and plaster. Little Bear! Omri! It was a voice from the room below. What are you doing up there? It was his mother. Then, quite distinctly, he heard his father's voice. I can hear that blasted rat pattering about all overhead. It's probably keeping the boys awake. I'd better go up, said his mother. A door closed below, and they heard her coming up the stairs. Even this dire prospect hardly had power to do more than push Omri's desperation one stage farther. He probably wouldn't have moved from his place on the floor if Patrick hadn't acted swiftly. Quick! Light off! Into bed! He pulled Omri up, snatched the lamp out of his hand, and switched it off. The candle was still down the hole. Patrick shoved the floorboard roughly back into position and moved the carpet so there was more or less covered the boards if you didn't look closely. Then he pushed Omri into his bed, covering him up. The footsteps were nearly at the door, and he had just flung himself down onto the folding bed when the door opened. Omri lay there with his eyes squeezed shut, thinking, Don't put the light on! Don't put the light on! Light was coming into the room from the landing, but not enough to see anything much. His mother stood there for what seemed like a hundred years. Finally, she whispered, Are you boys asleep? Needless to say, she got no reply. Omri? She tried once more. Then, after a hundred years, during which Omri imagined Little Bear being bitten half by the rat right underneath where he was lying, the door closed again, leaving them in darkness. Wait, wait, breathed Patrick. It was torture to wait. The rat had stopped moving when all the scuffling and footsteps had started. That was something. But now that it was quiet again, Omri imagined it creeping towards its prey, its pink nose twitching, its albino whiskers trembling hungrily. Oh, how, how could he have let Little Bear go down there? Boone's death would at least not have been his fault. But if Little Bear was killed, Omri knew he would never forgive himself. At long, long last, the living room door closed and both boys stole out of bed. Patrick reached the light first. Omri grabbed it, but Patrick insisted on looking first to see if Boone was still breathing. He was. They rolled back the carpet and lifted the board again, terrified that each movement would attract the grown-ups below. The homemade candle was burning away in the gloom like a little torch in a disused mine throwing its eerie light down the tunnel. Omri lay down flat. He didn't dare raise his voice. But he called softly. 
Little Bear, are you there? Come back. You're in terrible danger. Silence. Oh, God, why doesn't he come? Omri whispered frenziedly. At that moment, they did hear something. It was hard to identify the sound. It was the rattle, right? But what was it doing? There was no running sound. It just... What was it? It was just sort of a tiny shock, as if it had made one short, sudden movement. A pounce? Omri's heart was in his mouth. Then there were other sounds. If he was not used to straining his ears to catch the voices of little men, he might not have heard it. But he did hear it, and hope nearly lifted him off the ground. It was a faint, light scrambling sound, the sound of a small body getting through a hole in a hurry. Omri pulled the lamp out of the hole and thrust his arm in instead, his hand open. Almost at once he felt Little Bear jump, run into it. Omri closed his fingers just as something warm and furry brushed against their backs, the backs of his fingers. He snatched his arm out, grazing his knuckles against the splintery wood. There was something else in his hand, something cold and knobbly, twice as heavy as Little Bear. As you can imagine, he, opens his, he opened his fingers and both boys leaned over to look. Sitting on Omri's palm, filthy and bedraggled but triumphant, was Little Bear. And cradled in his arms, trailing cobwebs and a red satin ribbon, was the missing key. You've done it, oh, Little Bear, good for you. Now quick, said Omri, Patrick, get the candle up and put the floor back. I'll get the Red Cross man. Reckless now, they switched the top light on. Patrick was being as quiet as, quiet as he could, replaced the floorboard in the carpet, while Omri looked through the figures jumbled up in the biscuit tin. Lucky the army medical orderly was right on top, still holding his precious doctor's bag. Little Bear, meanwhile, stood beside the pallet bed on which Boone was lying, staring down at him, still clutching the key in his arms. Omri took it from him, thrust the plastic man into the cupboard, and turned the key. He made himself count to ten while Patrick watched, pop-eyed and scarcely breathing. Then he opened the door. There stood his old friend, Tommy, a bag at his feet, rubbing his eyes and frowning at, around him. His face cleared as he saw Omri. Well, if it ain't you again. I don't, I don't half pick my moments to drop off to sleep, I must say. Thunder and great mini whining overhead. Thought it was a goner. What's a mini? asked Patrick in a croaky voice. What, another one of you? asked Tommy gaping. I must have eaten too much cheese for my dinner. Shouldn't, shouldn't give us cheese before a big attack. Very hard on the stomach. Especially when it's churned up anyways, with nerves. What's a mini? It's the name of a mini werfer. That's one of them German shells. Make an horrible, make an horrible row, they do. Even before they land, a sort of whistle that gets louder and louder, and then kaboom! Then blokes with my job has to pick them up themselves up and run as you'd like to where it fell, and it fell in a trench to take care, and then, and if it fell in a trench, to take care of the wounded. We've got a wounded man here we want you to take care of, Omri said quickly. Oh, yes? The old redskin again, is it? No, it's another one. Could you step onto my hand? Omri lifted him to where Boone lay, and Tommy at once knelt down beside him and began a professional examination. He's in a bad way, he said after a few moments. Could do with a blood transfusion, really. I'll have to have his bandage off and look at his wound. He was cutting it off with a minute pair of scissors as he spoke. As the bandage opened up, the anxious watchers saw that the tuft of tissue was now red with blood. But Tommy said, Bleeding stopped. That's one good thing. What was it? A bullet? An arrow, said Omri, and Little Bear shivered all over. Oh, yes, of course I can see that now. Well, I'm not much up on arrow wounds. Ed's not still in the Ed's not still in there, I hope. No, it was pulled out. Good, good. Lucky it missed his heart. Well, I'll see what I can do. He got the hypodermic out of his bag and fiddled with it for a moment, and then plunged the needle into Boone's chest. After that he stitched up the wound, put a field dressing on it, and got Little Bear to help him peel off the rest of the old blood stained band aid. You a pal of his, are you? he asked the Indian. Little Bear stared at him but did not deny it. Then look here. When he wakes up, you give him these here pills. They're iron, see? Build him up. And these as well. They're for the pain. What we have to hope is that there won't be no infection. We need penicillin for him, said Patrick, who had once had a bad cut on his foot that had turned septic. Tommy looked at him blankly. 
Penicillin? What's that? Omri nudged Patrick. They haven't discovered it in his time, he whispered. Remember, this is like World War I. The best thing I can suggest is a drop of brandy, said Tommy, taking out a flask, pouring something down Boone's throat. Look there, he said cheerfully. He's getting a better colour already. He'll open his eyes soon. I wouldn't wonder. Kept him warm, that's the ticket. Or keep him warm, that's the ticket. Now I must be getting back. Waking up, I mean. And if that there mini's landing, I'll be in demand, that's n- no mistake. Omri carried him back to the cupboard. Tommy, he said, what if, what if the mini had fallen on you? <laughs> Couldn't have done, could it? If it had of, I wouldn't have be having this ear dream, would I? I'd be singing with an heavenly choir. Cheerably. Hurry up and shut the door. I think I can hear him calling stretcher bearer already. Omri smiled gratefully to him. He hated to send him back, but obviously he wanted to go. Goodbye, Tommy. Thanks. And good luck. And he shut the door. From the other end of the table, Little Bear suddenly called, Omri, come. Boone, open eyes. Boone, wake up. Omri and Patrick turned. Sure enough, there was Boone, staring up into Little Bear's face. What happened? He got out in a shaky voice. Nobody liked to tell him, but at last Little Bear had to confess. I shoot, he said. What you talking about, you crazy engine? I asked you what happened in the picture. Did them settlers beat the Redskins and get to where they was aiming to get to? Or did the Redskins carry off the women and scalp all the men, the dirty, low-down savages? Little Bear drew in his breath. His head, which had been hanging in shame, came up sharply, and to Omri's horror, he saw his hand go to his belt for his knife. Luckily, it wasn't there. But he jumped to his feet. Boone shut mouth. Not insult Indian braves or Little Bear shoot again. This time kill good. Take scalp. Hang on pole. Boone scalp too. Boone scalp too. Dirty hang on belt of Indian chief. Oh, Boone scalp too. Dirty to hang on the belt of Indian chief. And he snatched his chief's cloak off Boone's body and swirled it proudly around his own shoulders. Omri was shocked. Shocked. But Patrick was laughing so hard he could scarcely hold it in. But he controlled himself enough to wrap Boone up in the cutout blanket to keep him warm. Omri snatched Little Bear up between finger and thumb. Oh, so you're chief again, are you? He hissed furiously. Chiefs ought to know to keep their tempers. Here, he picked the broken headdress off the floor and fitted it lopsidedly onto Little Boone's head. Now, chief, have a good look at yourself. And he held Little Bear up before a mirror. Little Bear took just one look and hid his face in his hands. Just remember what you did to your friend. No friend, enemy, muttered Little Bear but the anger had gone out of them. Whatever he is, you've got a job to do. Where are those pills? You've got to see that he gets them. We can't. We can't even see them. So it's up to you. And when Boone is better, do you know what you're going to do? You're going to make him your blood brother. Little Bear shot him a quick startled look. Blood brother? You make little cuts on your wrists and tie them together so the blood mingles, and after that you can't be enemies ever again. It's an old Indian custom. Old Little Bear looked baffled. Not Indian custom. I'm sure it is. It was in a film I saw. White man idea, not Indian. Well, couldn't you do it just this once? Little Bear was silent for a moment, thinking. Then Omri saw the crafty look he knew of old coming into the Indian's face. Good, he said. Little Bear, give Boone medicine. Make him my brother when strong. And Omri put plastic in box. Make real wife for Little Bear. Not tonight, said Omri firmly. We've had enough excitement. Tonight you stand guard over Boone, give him his pills when he needs them, drinks of water, and all that. Tomorrow, if everything's all right, I'll bring your woman to life. That's a promise. All right, so I guessed wrong. We've still got one more chapter, it looks like. And I'll leave you here because we just did two. It's been a long clip. If you stuck with me, thanks so much. Next chapter is coming up. And uh, let me know in the comments if you like this, anything to switch up in the style or suggestions for other books. I always, always like hearing the feedback as I go here. Thanks for listening and reading with me.